Chapter 16 of Tales of the Royal Irish Constabulary by Unknown. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 16 Father John. The tiny village of Anagh lies on the eastern slope of the Slivenham Mountains, about fifteen miles due east of Ballybor, and consists of one dirty street with roughly forty-nine miserable tumble-down hovels and one grand slated two-storied house, as usual the shop and abode of the village Gombeen man, who also kept the post-office, not because he was the most honest man in the village, but because there was nobody else able to do so. A good many years ago, on a bitter winter's night, a tinker, answering to the name of Bernie MacAndrew, drove his ass-cart into the village of Anak and called at the only shop to know if there were any kettles or cans to be mended. The night was so cold and wet that the old shopkeeper, in the kindness of his heart, bade the shivering tinker put up his ass and spend the night. The tinker stayed and never left. McAndrew's stock in trade, when he arrived at Annick on that winter's night, consisted of half a barrel of salt herrings, a kettle, the usual tinker's soldering outfit, a policeman's discarded tunic, and the rags he stood up in. Within a year McAndrew had buried the old shopkeeper, who had lived alone for years and was beloved by all, and reigned in his place. Being an ambitious tinker, MacAndrew started a gombeen business with the old man's savings, which he found by chance in the secret drawer of an old desk, and in a very short time became the best hated and most feared man in the district. At first MacAndrew supported Sinn Féin enthusiastically, but when he saw law and order beginning to disappear, being now a man of property, he became alarmed and tried to run with the hare and the hounds. MacAndrew's great opponent was the young parish priest, Father John, who, after serving as a chaplain with the British Army in France with great distinction he had been decorated for bravery in the field by both the British and the French, returned to Ireland, having seen enough bloodshed for his lifetime. Father John was a grand man, both physically and morally, and in the right sense of the words, and if only the majority of young Irish priests were up to the standard of Father John, there would be little trouble in Ireland today. When he became the parish priest of Anagh, Father John saw at once that MacAndrew was fast reducing the great majority of his parishioners, who were poor men with poorer mountain land, to a state of slavery, and realized that it only wanted two bad years in succession to put the whole parish under the Gombeen man's thumb. At first he tried to keep the farmers away from MacAndrew's shop, but this they resented, as it entailed a journey of many miles to the nearest town and then they had to pay nearly as much as to MacAndrew. Next he denounced MacAndrew and his evil practices from the altar, warning the people of the consequences, but in spite of all the priest could do or say, the Gombeen man flourished. From the very first Father John opposed the Sinn Féin movement, both by word and deed, and when the first Sinn Féin organizers appeared in his parish, he quickly hunted them away. But before he knew what was happening, practically every young man in the parish had been enrolled, whether he liked it or not, as a soldier in the IRA. MacAndrew was quick to seize his chance of revenge, telling the people that the priest was a secret agent of the British government. Hadn't he served in the British army and taken the pay of the British government, an enemy of the people? And that he was doing his best to stand between them and liberty. In a week Father John was practically an outlaw in his own parish, and MacAndrew became the popular hero. Though he still officiated in the chapel, Sinn Féin saw to it that he was paid no dues. For nearly two years this state of affairs continued, and it would have been impossible for the priest to live if the older and more sober members of his flock had not come to his house secretly in the dead of night and paid him their dues. One day, when feeling ran very high, Father John opened his daily paper to see his own death reported, and a long obituary notice, probably the handiwork of MacAndrew. It was a situation common in Ireland, the peasants blind to the virtues of their truest friend, and making a popular idol of their worst enemy. It is a sad thing that many Irishmen will always insist on believing what they wish to believe. Father John was by nature a kindly and genial man, a lover of sport, of a good horse, and of the society of men, and those two years must have been a perfect hell on earth for him. 
not that any one was ever openly rude to him they just sent him to coventry and kept him there hoping to break his heart and that by refusing to pay him any dues they would gradually freeze him out and in his place would come one of those fire-eating young priests who would lead them to victory and freedom the summer of nineteen twenty was wet and cold with frosty nights during every month except july now if your potatoes grow in boggy land and there comes heavy rain followed by a night's frost not once but several times you will have no potatoes and probably very little crop of any kind and if your living depends on the potato crop you stand a good chance of starving unless the gombeen man will come to your assistance by november the whole parish of anach practically belonged to macandrew who held a mortgage on nearly every acre of tenanted land and proceeded to bully the people to his heart's content on a sunday morning in december at about ten o'clock the hour when the village usually began to come to life the inhabitants were startled by the screams of a woman and when they rushed to their doors saw macandrew's servant running out of the village toward father john's house macandrew had been murdered during the night without a sound and the servant had no idea of what had happened until she went to his room to see why he had not got up all macandrew's books had been burnt and afterwards the murderers must have cursed the day they did not set a light to the house as well on the next day the village woke up to find a company of auxiliaries billeted in macandrew's house and the yard full of their cars a case of out of the frying pan into the fire for some time past the police had known that men on the run were hiding in the mountains near Anak, but though the area came within blake's district it was impossible to keep any control over it owing to the fact that the owenmore river and the slievenamo mountains lay between it and ballybor the auxiliaries spent the day fortifying macandrew's house and that night started operations and the inhabitants soon realized that the british empire was not yet an also ran just as it was getting dark the auxiliaries and crosleys would suddenly burst out of macandrew's yard travel perhaps five or ten miles at racing speed and then surround and round up a village or district so that the numerous gunmen who had come from the south for a rest cure found it impossible to get any sleep at all the local volunteers at once sent an s o s to dublin and received the comforting answer that a flying column would arrive shortly in the district and deal effectively with the auxiliaries in the meanwhile they were to harass the enemy by every means in their power and carry on a warfare of attrition in other words if they found one or two cadets alone if unarmed so much the better they were to murder them at first the local volunteers were very much afraid of the auxiliaries sinn fein propaganda having taught them to expect nothing but murder rape and looting from the scum of english prisons and asylums but after a few days had passed and nothing dreadful happened to man or woman they took heart once more and started their usual warfare the auxiliaries were commanded by a major jones and on the sunday following their arrival in anach jones left alone in a ford at an early hour to see blake in ballybor the road crosses the mountains through a narrow pass and near the top of the pass there is a small chapel a school a pub and a few scattered cottages on his return jones passed this chapel as the people were coming out from mass blew his horn and slowed up after passing through the crowd he noticed a group of youth standing on the right side of the road and opened his throttle wide thereby probably saving his life when the car was within ten yards of the group every man drew a pistol and it seemed to jones as though he was flying through a shower of bullets however though the car was riddled and had any one been sitting on the other three seats they would all have been killed jones found himself uninjured and the old tin lizzie responding well to the throttle flew down the hill at twice the pace henry ford ever meant her to travel at that evening father john called on jones and apologized for the outrage and jones at once fell under the charm of the priest probably his astonishment at father john's visit had something to do with it but in the days to come when father john supported his words by deeds jones learnt that his first impression had been a correct one returning in the early hours of the morning from a raiding expedition to the south of anach the auxiliaries were surprised to see a tall priest standing in the middle of the road and holding up his hand 
fearing a trap there was a blind corner just behind where the priest was standing they stopped about two hundred yards off and beckoned to the priest to advance they were still more surprised to find that the tall priest was father john who having received information after they had started that the volunteers were going to lay trees across the road at this corner in the hope of smashing up the auxiliary cars had spent the whole night walking up and down the road in order that he might warn them of their danger father john drove back to anach with the cadets and by the time they reached the village every cadet swore that the priest was the finest man they had yet met in ireland and they didn't believe there was a finer one from that on father john accompanied the auxiliaries on many a stunt and there is no doubt that he gave them every help in his power and all information which reached him but though he would travel anywhere with them he would never accept hospitality from them nor would he enter macandrew's house about six miles from Anach, in a hollow of the mountains is the tiny village of glenmuck completely isolated from the rest of the world and so situated that its presence was quite hidden until you literally walked on top of it none of the inhabitants who live chiefly by making poteen in the winter time and going to england as harvesters in the summer possessed a cart for the very good reason that the nearest so-called third-class road was five miles away and only a goat track passed within a mile of the place here in due course arrived the flying column of the i r a seventy strong every man mounted on a bicycle and armed with a british service rifle and as many pistols as he could find room for they were also the proud possessors of a lewis gun as usual the gunmen were billeted so many in each farm and after being badly harassed for some time in the south glenmuck seemed like paradise to them the nights were spent in dancing card-playing and drinking poteen somewhere about noon the gunmen got up and after breakfast visited each other in their different billets after the fashion of our troops in france walking about openly with their rifles slung over their shoulders the lewis gun team passed their days teaching the boys and girls of the village the mechanism of the lewis gun the leader's idea was to give his men much needed rest and amusement for a few days and then to try and ambush the auxiliaries and probably they could have spent quite a long time resting here without the auxiliaries having the slightest suspicion of their near presence but war seems to be made up so largely of ifs and the if in this case proved to be father john when out riding on his rounds one morning the priest noticed that most of the young people of his parish appeared to be gravitating in their best clothes towards glenmuck and suspecting a poteen orgy he sternly commanded a young damsel to tell him why she was going to glenmuck and the girl told him father john rode straight back to anach to be just in time to stop jones from starting off on a raid in the opposite direction jones first sent off a cadet on a motor bicycle to blake at ballybor sending him a verbal outline of his plan of attack on glenmuck and asking him to cooperate with the auxiliaries from the other side of the mountains he then turned out every cadet in the place left macandrew's house empty to take care of itself and made off at full speed in the direction of glenmuck with the priest acting as guide they reached the nearest point to glenmuck on the road at noon and after leaving a small guard over the crosleys the rest of the company set out in open order across the mountain for the flying column's lair the gunmen had had great luck in the south for a long time and their luck still held a youth making his way across the country to get a sight of the wonderful gunman happened to look behind him when on top of a rise and saw about a mile away the oncoming auxiliaries being a sharp youth he realized who they were and ran for the village as fast as his young legs would carry him and by chance ran straight into the leader when he entered the outskirts of the place reaching the hill above the village the auxiliaries made a last desperate rush down the slope in the hope of catching the gunmen scattered in the different cottages and so mopping them up before they could get together but by this time the flying column had taken up positions on the top of the far slope above the village and as the cadets reached the cottages they came under heavy machine-gun fire quickly realizing what had happened jones ordered one platoon to make a frontal attack on the gunmen's position while he sent a second and third platoon to try to work round their flanks the fourth platoon he kept with him under cover in the village 
then followed a very pretty fight for an hour by which time the gunmen like the boers of old thought it was time to move on and take up a position on the next ridge jones knew that if he could only keep in close touch with the flying column it was only a question of time before blake who would be guided by the heavy firing would attack them in the rear and that they would then stand a good chance of bagging the whole lot the fight gradually worked across the mountains the gunmen retreating from ridge to ridge while the cadets stuck to them like grim death always striving to pin them down and when they retreated to drive them in the direction from which blake ought to appear late in the afternoon heavy shooting suddenly broke out behind the gunmen and the cadets redoubled their efforts to close with them by this time the opposing forces had worked their way down the western slopes of the mountains almost as far as the high upland bogs and directly the gunmen realized that they were likely to be surrounded they broke and fled down the valley closely pursued by police and cadets unfortunately the light was getting bad and the gunmen's luck still held good when they had gone about a mile they came across a big party of country people with whom they mixed and when the police came up with them it was impossible to tell gunmen from peasants probably the former were busily engaged cutting turf while the latter looked on their arms were passed to the women who hid the rifles in the heather and secreted the pistols and ammunition on their persons during the whole long fight father john attended to wounded cadet and gunmen alike always to be seen where the fight was hottest and though his calling was conspicuous from his clothes and white collar yet on several occasions the gunmen deliberately fired on him when attending to a wounded cadet after the battle of glenmuck the flying column was seen no more in that district and for weeks the local volunteers gave jones no trouble time after time jones had received information that certain young men in and about a knock carried arms but whenever they were surprised in a shop or pub no arms could be found on them and it was noticed that they always moved about in the company of certain girls soon after the battle of glenmuck the bells of the district received the shock of their lives when shopping in a town some miles away with these young men about noon four crossley loads of cadets suddenly dashed into the town with two women searchers dressed in dark blue uniforms and that day the first real haul of revolvers and automatics was made as usual the men passed their arms to the girls directly they saw the auxiliaries arrive but this time no notice was taken of the men while the girls who on former occasion had stood looking on and jeering at the cadets found themselves quickly rounded up and the women searchers soon did the rest after this the moral effect of the women searchers was so great that not a girl in the district dare carry arms or even dispatches the girls were not sure whether the searchers were women or young cadets dressed up as women and this uncertainty greatly increased their alarm about six weeks later jones found out that a much wanted dublin gunman called foy who had murdered at least two british officers in cold blood was hidden in the district and was being fed by his mother and sister who lived about two miles from Anach. time after time the cadets tried to surprise mrs foy or her daughter carrying food to foy's hiding place but always in vain foy's presence soon began to be felt in the district two cadets returning off leave in mufti and unarmed were taken out of the train and murdered just outside the station their bodies being left there for all who passed to see and no man dared to touch the bodies until the police arrived next the cadets were ambushed twice in one week both times unsuccessfully father john who had hoped that at last his parish had returned to the paths of peace was furious and denounced from the altar all men and women who shielded murderers finally after the murder of the two cadets he refused holy communion to mrs foy and her daughter which is a very serious step for a priest to take and when remonstrated with he replied that sooner than not denounce and punish murderers and those who aided and abetted them he would throw off his coat and become an auxiliary more power to you father john End of chapter sixteen
Chapter Seventeen of Tales of the Royal Irish Constabulary by Unknown. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Seventeen: The Bog Cemetery. After many months of the Sinn Fein terror, the town of Ballybor became a place of shadows and whispers. At night time, men saw shadows, real and unreal, moving and stationary, at every corner of the streets and in every lane and during the daytime when men met in the streets they would only speak in low whispers to each other and always keeping one eye over their shoulder public opinion withered and died sinn fein had no use for it men became completely detached mere spectators of the unchecked and uncondemned orgy of crime like the younger generation in england who waste a large part of their lives in picture houses gazing at films of vice and crime and if a man had been murdered in the main street at Ballybor in the middle of the day, not a hand would have been raised to save the victim. The inhabitants would simply have regarded the incident in the light of a film, and then gone home to their dinners. The oft-heard remark when a policeman has been murdered, that it served him right for joining the IRC, epitomizes the attitude of the majority of the Irish public towards so-called political murder as a rule an irishman on being asked if there was any news in the paper would reply no only the usual columns of murders and outrages walter drake as his name implies was descended from an elizabethan soldier who had settled in the west of ireland and built a large house about two miles from ballybor and here for many generations the drakes had lived hunted and farmed walter drake had at an early age entered the army through sandhurst but retired after six years service on the death of his father and since then had lived at the manor spending a large part of his time helping his poorer neighbors in every way in his power a quiet man of a retiring nature a popular magistrate and a good neighbor but a determined loyalist called up again in august nineteen fourteen he had served throughout the war with distinction in his old regiment to return once more to his home had drake lived in any civilized country in the world he would most assuredly have died in his bed when his time came esteemed by all as a just kindly and honorable man but as in war the best seem to be always taken so it has been in ireland his only crimes appear to have been that he continued to act as a magistrate after receiving an order from the ira to resign his commission of the peace and devoting himself to helping ex-soldiers in the town to get their pensions and trying to get grants of land for such as were worthy the granting of land to ex-soldiers was bitterly opposed by the transport union who wanted every acre for their own landless members and probably being a personal friend of blake's and beloved by the police force would constitute another crime in the eyes of the i r a on a certain monday night the constable on duty at ballybor barracks reported that a great light could be seen in the sky and thought there must be a big fire not far from the town going to the top of the barracks blake at once saw that a large house must be on fire and judging from the direction the chances were that it was the manor taking a dozen men in a crosley he at once went off there to find the grand old house burning fiercely and by the light of the fire he could make out a pathetic group of figures on the tennis ground in front of the house the first person whom blake met was the old butler who told a tale now familiar in many parts of ireland to-day the household had retired at their usual hour of eleven after which the butler had carefully closed up the house and gone to the servants hall to smoke a pipe before turning in soon afterwards he heard a loud knocking at the front door followed by a volley of shots some of which must have been fired through the windows as he could hear the sound of falling glass the old man went and opened the front door to be met by a ring of rifles shotguns pistols and electric torches behind which he could make out the usual mob of masked ruffians a strange voice then demanded major drake and when the butler told them that the major had gone to dublin by the mail that day a man handed him a letter telling him that in ten minutes time they were going to burn the house to the ground and that he had better warn the inmates if he didn't want them roasted alive the butler at once took the letter to miss drake who read the following pleasant communication addressed to her brother major drake 
owing to your aggressively anti-irish attitude we have received orders to burn your house to the ground you will be given ten minutes to collect your clothes by order i r a the girl hurriedly slipped on a dressing-gown and went down to the hall to find it full of the brutes sprawling in chairs and smoking the leader came forward to speak to her and she begged him to have mercy on her mother who was old and in feeble health and who would surely be killed by the shock of having her house burnt and being turned out into the night and implored the man to take anything he wanted offering him all the money she had and her mother's jewellery for answer the man pulled out his watch and said that she had exactly ten minutes to get her old english mother out of the house no more and no less seeing that it was useless to argue with the brute miss drake called the butler and her mother's maid woke up the old lady dressed her the best way they could and as the household passed out through the central hall they saw men sprinkling the furniture and carpets with petrol hardly had they reached the lawn when the men rushed out past them there was a violent explosion petrol tins bursting and the house seemed to burst into flames in an instant and here they remained on the tennis ground helpless and hopeless their only crime loyalty until blake found them there silently crying seeing that the house was gone that in fact it was impossible to save anything blake put the drakes into the crosley with the old butler and the servants and drove them to a hotel in the town drake had been seen motoring through ballybor to the station on the monday and by that evening there was a whisper in the town that something had happened to him but what the something was the whisper did not mention during the tuesday rumour lay dormant on wednesday however rumour awoke and rapidly made up for lost time and by that evening it was freely whispered throughout the town that drake had joined the i r a that he had bolted to canada to escape from the i r a only to be taken out of the train on his way to dublin by a flying column of gunmen tried by a court-martial condemned and executed that he had gone to dublin to join the auxiliaries and lastly that he had gone to london to get married on wednesday morning miss drake whose poor old mother lay in a state of collapse at the hotel came to blake in great distress and implored him to find her brother she was sure something must have happened to him as she had wired twice and then getting no reply had wired to the secretary of his club where he had intended staying and from whom an answer had just come to say major drake had not arrived blake promised to do all he could and started off at once to the station to make inquiries having found out that drake actually did leave ballybor by the mail train on monday he next sent an urgent cipher message to the authorities in dublin hoping they would be able to trace him there blake then set out for knockshinnock the next station on the line to dublin about a mile from the small town of the same name and situated in the midst of a vast bog which stretches towards the foot of the mountains to the east and west and runs nearly as far as ballybor here acting on the assumption that the rumour of drake having left the mail train at this station was correct blake carefully interrogated the station master and the three porters one and all denied having seen drake on the day in question one porter who had been there years adding inconsequently that he did not even know him by sight and thereby making blake sure that he was on the right track at last that night blake again visited the station master at his house in the station after midnight and pretending that he knew for certain that drake had left the train at knockshinnock warned the man of the serious consequences of refusing to give information one a m is an unpleasant hour to interview armed men and thinking that the police were uncomfortably near and the i r a in the dim distance the station master made a full confession a few minutes before the limited mail arrived at knockshinnock on monday three armed and masked men had driven up in a ford car and directly the train pulled up had made straight for the carriage in which drake was travelling at once they seized him and dragged him struggling out of the carriage to the car and then drove off rapidly in the direction of ballybor before the train pulled out a stranger in a third-class carriage warned the station-master in the name of the i r a to give no information to any one
As no further information could be got from the station master, Blake returned to the barracks and set out again for Knockshinnock after breakfast to endeavour to trace the ford from there. The road from Knockshinnock to Ballybor runs practically the whole way through a vast bog, which is drained by the Owenmore River, with a deep fringe of water meadow on each bank at intervals side roads connect up the villages on the higher ground near the mountains with the main road the police had covered nearly three miles of the road without getting any news of drake or the ford when a sharp-eyed sergeant noticed the narrow tracks of a ford turning up one of these side roads to the east the car had turned the corner sharply leaving a deep track of two wheels in the soft ground on the edge of the road turning down this side road they proceeded slowly without seeing any further car tracks until they came to a long low cottage standing back about fifteen yards from the road here they found tracks which showed that the car had pulled up at the door of the cottage turned and returned towards the main road leaving his men outside blake entered with a sergeant in time to see the owner bolting out the back door only to be caught by the sergeant and brought back the man said his name was Moran, and protested his loyalty loudly before Blake could ask him a question. In Ireland, if you want information badly, often the best way to obtain it is to bluff your opponent into believing that you already know part of it, leaving him to guess as to how much you know. Blake took this line of attack with Moran, and asked him the names of the four men who had called at his cottage on the previous Monday in a car but moran knew the game as well as blake and denied that any car had been to his house lately or indeed at any time whereby blake knew that the man lied and had something to conceal he then threatened moran that if he did not tell all he knew he would arrest him and keep him until he did and at the same time took him outside and pointed out the old tracks of a car in front of the cottage this had the desired effect and at long last blake thought their search was at an end moran it appeared was the caretaker of an i r a cemetery or rather an old disused cemetery where formerly unbaptized children were buried and which now was used to bury volunteers who had gone to america on the monday in question three armed and masked men had driven up to his house with a prisoner and after trying him by court-martial in the cottage had taken him to the cemetery and made moran help them to dig a grave while the unfortunate prisoner looked on they blindfolded and shot him and finally forced moran to put the body in the grave and fill it in they then left though hard pressed moran denied any knowledge of the identity of the masked men or their victim and when told to describe the murdered man gave a description which might have applied to hundreds of men blake then ordered moran to show him the cemetery but when thus driven into a corner he took on the courage of a cornered rat and though they tried for an hour not one inch would he go seeing that the man was desperate and would have died sooner than show them the cemetery blake returned to the barracks that night as soon as it was dark a strong police force rounded up the six leading volunteers in ballybor and took them out to moran's house in two crosleys arriving as the full moon was showing over the top of the mountains at the first knock on the door moran came out his face contracted with fear which turned to relief on seeing the uniforms of the police but when he saw the six volunteers he nearly collapsed blake now ordered moran to lead them to the cemetery and so great was the man's terror that he started off across the bog without a word after walking over a mile in the moonlight they came to a low ridge of limestone mounds running through the bog and parallel to the mountains here in a hollow was the old graveyard which looked like a disused sheep pen such as the country people use for the rounding up of mountain sheep when the different owners pick out their own sheep and lambs to brand them the cemetery was surrounded by a stone wall broken down in many places and inside was a tangled mass of elder and thorn bushes after posting sentries round the graveyard blake made moran point out the latest grave and after the trembling man had shown them a mound between two bushes he ordered two of the volunteers to start opening the grave with spades brought by the police presently one of the spades met something in a sack and on opening the sack they found the body of a short dark man obviously a peasant whereas drake had been a tall fair man 
On examination, they found wounds in the body and left leg. For a moment, Blake was quite nonplussed. He had been so sure that the body would be Drake's. He was certain that the station master had spoken the truth, and there seemed no reason to doubt Moran's evidence, though why he should be in such a state of terror was not plain. Further, it was now five days since Drake was supposed to have been murdered, and the body they had just dug up had obviously been in the ground two days at the most, probably only one. A careful examination of the cemetery showed that there was no other recent grave. Blake's thoughts were interrupted by one of the volunteers, a man called Brogan, asking, with his tongue in his cheek and an impudent sneer, "'Is your honour satisfied now, and will we be after burying the poor fellow decently again?' Taking no notice of Brogan's question, Blake told a sergeant to make the volunteers carry the dead man to the Crosleys and to wait for him there. After they had gone, he made Moran go down on his knees and swear on his oath that the body they had dug up was the man who had been executed on the previous Monday. But Moran could only swear that he had been so frightened at the time that he had not taken any notice of the prisoner, but that, to the best of his belief, the body was the one he had buried. Moran then broke down and had to be half-carried, half-led to his cottage, where they left him, and returned to Ballybor with the volunteers and the corpse for a military investigation. The failure to find Drake's body in the bog cemetery forced Blake to follow up the other rumours regarding his sudden disappearance, but every rumour and clue failed him, and it looked as though Drake's fate was to be added to the long list of unsolved Irish crimes. Two days after the police had visited the cemetery, Blake received information that arms for a police ambush had been brought into Murrisk Townland, and also that poteen was being freely made and drunk there. Having arranged with a company of auxiliaries stationed in Anak to cooperate with him, Blake left the barracks with two Crosley loads of police and a Ford an hour before dawn one morning, and as the day broke, the auxiliaries and police started to close in a cordon on the village and outlying farms where they suspected the arms were hidden. The first signs of life were two women running across a bog, and when followed, one of them was seen by Blake with his glasses to throw a still into a bog hole, while the other one took two large jars from under her shawl and smashed them together into pieces. The women were quickly rounded up, and on being taken to the nearest house, the police found six fully dressed men well tucked up in two beds, and the remains of a huge fire in the kitchen, while the whole house reeked of poteen good circumstantial evidence that the party of eight had spent the night running a still. After a long and fruitless search for arms, Blake found himself close to Murrisk Abbey, so after sending the auxiliaries back to Anak, he went to pay the Macnessa a visit. The old man was delighted to see him, and insisted that he should stay to dinner, and the police should have drink and food. Blake and the Macnessa dined alone, and over the port the old man started to tell Blake tales of his youth. After his second glass and the long day in the cold, Blake began to feel drowsy, and his thoughts wandered to Drake and the grave in the bog cemetery, only to wake up with a start, hearing the old man say something about a grave, followed by, "'Is your honour satisfied now?' Apologizing for his deafness, he asked the Macnessa to begin again, and the old man told a rambling story of a butler of his young days called Faherty, whose chief recreation was shooting rabbits in the park during the summer evenings. Close to the park lived a pompous retired shopkeeper named Malone, who had a very fine red setter which was always wandering in the park, like Faherty, after rabbits. On several occasions Faherty and Malone had had words over the setter, and the climax was reached when Malone arrived at the abbey one evening, purple with rage, and insisting on seeing the Macnessa, burst into a study, accused Faherty of having shot his setter, and added that he knew that the dog was buried in a shrubbery at the back of the house. The Macnessa at once called for Faherty, the three proceeded straight to the shrubbery with a spade, and Faherty was made to open the grave, which they found there. After digging down a short way, he came on the body of a cur dog, to Malone's great astonishment and disappointment, and Faherty asked in a voice of triumph, "'Is your honour satisfied now?' 
after malone had gone home the mac nessa asked faherty for an explanation and the butler told his master how he had shot malone's setter by mistake in the dust and then buried him in the shrubbery the following day he heard that malone suspected him and had heard of the funeral in the shrubbery so the next night he shot a cur dog and buried him on top of the setter on the way back to the barracks blake could not help thinking of the similarity of the remarks of faherty and brogan when the bodies of the cur dog and the dark peasant were dug up and that night he dreamt that he was opening an endless row of graves and never knew whether he would dig up a cur dog or a dark peasant and all the time he was hoping to find drake's body at last he came to a grave where he was positive he would find drake and started to dig like mad only to wake up and find his own red setter on his bed blake now determined to renew his efforts to find drake he ordered the head constable to round up the same six volunteers and as soon as this was done set off once more for the bog cemetery making their way to moran's house they learnt from his wife that the previous evening her husband had been removed by masked men with shovel hats and wearing black mackintoshes the wife noticing the black mackintoshes accused the police borrowing a couple of spades the police then went to the graveyard and as soon as the dark man's grave could be found blake ordered the volunteers to open it again and at the same time watched brogan's face carefully on the way out of the cemetery brogan had been laughing and sneering as on the former occasion but directly he heard blake's order he went as white as a sheet and began to tremble and a look of terror leapt into his eyes blake knew that at last he was on the right track none of the volunteers moved waiting for brogan to give a lead and blake had to repeat his order calling on brogan by name to start digging pulling himself together with a great effort the volunteer commenced slowly to throw the earth out of the grave the sweat though it was a cold day pouring down his face the lower brogan dug the slower he dug until at last when he had excavated about two feet of soil he suddenly fainted and collapsed into the shallow grave the police were by now strung up to the highest pitch of excitement and a huge sergeant who had been a great favorite with drake suddenly gave a hoarse shout and jumping into the grave threw brogan out and started digging like a madman while the rest began to fidget with the triggers of their rifles and look ominously at the uneasy volunteers suddenly the sergeant's spade met a soft resistance and in a few seconds he had uncovered and opened a sack to find as blake expected the body of poor drake with a huge expanding bullet hole through his forehead the next five minutes will always be to blake a nightmare the police went stark mad when highly disciplined troops break they are far worse to handle than any undisciplined crowd and with a howl of rage made for the cowering volunteers ignoring blake's shouts and to this day blake has no idea of how he kept his men from taking revenge on the volunteers probably he would have failed but for the lucky chance of noticing that brogan who had come to was trying to escape the diversion of chasing brogan brought the police back to their senses and by the time he had been captured and brought back discipline was completely restored before they left the cemetery brogan made a complete confession of all he knew about the tragedy he told blake that information had been given to g h q of the i r a in dublin that drake was on the point of taking command of a company of auxiliaries who were to be stationed in his own house the idea being to use drake's local knowledge which blake knew to be quite untrue on the sunday two gunmen arrived from dublin with orders to shoot drake and burn his house finding out that drake intended to go to dublin the following day by the mail train they commandeered a ford at ballybor taking brogan with them as a guide and took him out of the train at knockshinnock and after the murder they returned to ballybor superintended the burning of drake's house and then disappeared into the night on stolen bicycles shortly afterwards brogan heard a rumor that drake had been murdered and buried in the bog cemetery and he became very uneasy that night he and three of the volunteers received orders to take part in a police ambush on the far side of the slivenamo mountains which order they obeyed going in a ford 
in the ambush a strange gunman none of the local volunteers knew who he was or where he came from was killed and when some argument arose as to how to dispose of his body brogan at once volunteered to take the body back with him and bury it in the bog cemetery his intention being to bury the gunman on top of drake so that if by chance the police opened the grave they would find the body of the gunman and be put off the scent after the first visit of the police the volunteers had removed moran to a sinn fein detention prison fearing that he might break down and give information End of chapter seventeen chapter eighteen of tales of the royal irish constabulary by unknown this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eighteen a jew in gaelic clothing beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing but inwardly they are ravening wolves st matthew seven fifteen probably very few people in england have the remotest idea to what extent anarchy was rife throughout the south and west of ireland even in parts of loyal ulster during the year nineteen twenty most of the irish members of parliament seventy-three to be exact swore allegiance to dial Arinine. of these seven lived abroad and the remainder spent most of their time in prison at the beginning of the year sinn fein captured practically every county council rural council and poor law guardians board in twenty-seven counties nearly all these boards defied the local government board and took their orders from dial Arinine direct next came the burning of county and civil courts police barracks and petty sessions courts followed by murderous attacks on police and loyalists throughout the south and west though chiefly in the south at first in many parts loyalists were forced under the jurisdiction of sinn fein land arbitration and civil courts solicitors had their choice of practicing in these courts or not practicing at all and a solicitor must live as well as another man the police had no power outside their barracks and in many districts a policeman was never seen for weeks on end whole districts being policed by civilian volunteers a large national loan was raised openly in defiance of the british government its avowed purpose being to carry on war against england and to break up the british army sinn fein banks and insurance societies were floated the money obtained being used for the same purposes sinn fein laws were passed and enforced and a large army organized and built up drilled and armed at this time the british prime minister repeatedly assured the country that there never could and never would be an irish republic while lloyd george talked de valera acted and the republic came into being while lloyd george was still talking during the summer of nineteen nineteen a very ordinary and at first uninteresting strike of shop assistants took place in ballybor for higher wages and shorter hours and the shopkeepers managed to carry on with the aid of their families and few of the public suffered any inconvenience from the strike good relations still existed between master and employee in nearly every shop in the town and the shopkeepers were just on the point of an amicable settlement with their assistants when a transport union agitator or as he called himself a gaelic organizer appeared on the scene and in a few hours the whole situation was changed the local secretary of the transport union to which the shop assistants belonged at once broke off all negotiations with the shopkeepers and before night several acts of sabotage had been committed in the town the next morning saw the strike begin afresh in deadly earnest every street was picketed by strikers who refused to allow any one townspeople or country people to purchase any foodstuffs until the shopkeepers had given in to their impossible demands doubtless the idea was that the starving people would bring such pressure to bear on the shopkeepers that they would be forced to give in and grant practically any terms to the shop assistants in a word the old game of blackmail several unfortunate old country women who had managed to evade the pickets and to purchase provisions were caught on their way home by the strikers and their purchases trodden into the mud of the streets 
One old clergyman, who lived several miles from Ballybor in an isolated district, managed not only to dodge the pickets and buy much needed food, but to get two miles on his way home. However, a picket of shop boys mounted on bicycles overtook him, threw all his provisions into a bog hole, beat him severely, turned his pony loose in the bog, and left him by the roadside. At first the shopkeepers were bewildered and at a complete loss to understand the sudden change in the attitude of their assistants, but on hearing Padre Kelly, the so-called Gaelic organizer, make his first public speech, they knew at once what they were up against. In 1914, before the war broke out, all thinking Irishmen knew that the coming and growing danger in Ireland was the transport union, formed originally for the perfectly legitimate object of raising the status and wages of the working classes, quite apart from the small farmer class, by combined action. But in a very short time this union became the instrument of Bolshevism in Ireland under the able command of James Connolly a disciple of Lenin's long before the latter had risen to power. And so thoroughly and well had Connolly made his plans for the future that in every town and village the complete machinery of Soviet government had been prepared, ready to start working the instant the revolution should break out. Men had been appointed to every public office, and the houses of the well-to-do allotted to the different commissioners and officers of each local Soviet. Luckily for Ireland, the rebellion of 1916 saw the end of James Connolly, probably the most dangerous and one of the cleverest men of modern times in Ireland. With the death of Connolly and the disappearance of Larkin to America, the transport union fell into the hands of less able men, but still carried on successfully with agrarian agitation, though marking time as regards revolution. After the war, the Union found itself up against Sinn Féin, and for a time it looked as though the two parties would come to blows, and so nullify each other's efforts. Unfortunately, both parties saw that their only chance of success was to cooperate. Doubtless the Transport Union thought that if the rebellion was successful, their chance would come in the general confusion, and that they would be able to get their Soviet government working before the Sinn Féiners could get going. During 1919 and 1920, Sinn Féin and the Transport Union nearly came to blows on several occasions in the West over agrarian trouble. The Transport Union wanted to take advantage of the absence of law and order to hunt every landlord and big farmer out of the country and divide their lands among the landless members of the Union, while Sinn Féin policy was to wait until the Republic had been set up when, so they declared, there would be an equitable division made. The Ballybor strike collapsed as suddenly as it had started with the disappearance of Pedro Gokelli. The previous day a public meeting on the town fair green had been held by the transport union, and all the young men and girls of the town and countryside had attended. At first the local firebrands addressed the meeting with their usual grievance, and then Okelly spoke for a full hour. At first he confined himself to the strike, and carried his audience with him when he painted a vivid picture of the different lives led by the shopkeepers and their uh, slaves, how the former and their families lived on the fat of the land, the latter in the gutter. The crowd had now had all they wanted and were prepared to go home to tea, but O'Kelly had a good deal more to tell them. Suddenly, and without any warning, he began to unfold the doctrine of Lenin, to show them how the world and all the good things in it ought really to belong to them, and that these good things would never be theirs until the ruling classes were forced to disgorge them, and that the only way to make the swine disgorge was to kill them one and all, gentry, businessmen, and shopkeepers. The man could really speak and held his audience spellbound while he unfolded the Irish El Dorado of the future. But through all his speech ran the one idea to kill, always to kill, those in a higher station of life than his listeners. To finish with, he called upon them to start with the police, to shoot them like the dogs they were, and when they were gone the rest would be easy.' 
Sergeant McGrath had been detailed to attend the meeting to take down in shorthand any speeches which might require explaining afterwards, but until O'Kelly started to preach the doctrine of Lenin, he had not opened his notebook. The sergeant had served in most parts of Ireland, but O'Kelly's speech and brogue puzzled him. The man spoke like an Englishman trying to imitate the Irish brogue, but with a thickness of speech which the sergeant could not place, nor could he place the shape of O'Kelly's head, a round bullet-shaped one with a high narrow forehead and coarse black hair. He duly reported O'Kelly's speech to the D.I., who endeavored to find out where the man came from, but failed to get any definite information. One rumor said that O'Kelly came from Cork, another from America, and yet a third that he was a native of Castleport. So the only thing to do was to arrest the man and then try to identify him. But O'Kelly had completely disappeared. Nothing further appears to have been heard of O'Kelly in Ireland during 1919, but the following year an itinerant lecturer on beekeeping turned up in County Donegal, who bore a strong resemblance to Lennon's disciple. This man's practice was to give a short lecture on bees in schoolhouses and then to launch forth into pure Bolshevism, a complete waste of time on the average Donegal peasant. Next he was heard of in Belfast, where he was lucky to escape a violent death at the hands of some infuriated shipyard workers. In May 1920 the transport union in Ballybor began suddenly to give Blake a lot of trouble cases of men being dragged out of their beds at night and forced with a loaded gun at their heads to join the union steadily increased several landlords who employed a good many men were threatened that if they did not pay a higher wage than the maximum laid down by law all their men would be called out and that they would in addition be boycotted and any who refused at once had their hayricks burnt and their cattle injured Rumors came to Blake's ears of a man making extraordinary speeches at night in the different country schoolhouses throughout the district to audiences of young men and girls, speeches which apparently combined Sinn Féin aims with Red Revolution. During 1920, Sergeant McGrath had been sent to Grouse Lodge as sergeant in charge, and thinking that he recognized O'Kelly and the revolutionary lecturer who was touring the district, he kept a careful watch on the Clunala schoolhouse, and within a week had surprised and captured the man who turned out to be O'Kelly. O'Kelly was brought up before the R.M. in Ballybor Barracks, charged with inciting the people to murder the police during the strike of 1919, and pleaded not guilty. The R.M., who looked upon the man as a harmless lunatic, he had not heard him haranguing a crowd, offered to let him go, provided he entered into a recognizance to be of good behavior and could find two sureties in fairly substantial sums. O'Kelly replied that he dared not enter into a recognizance to be of good behavior, and further that if he was released he would continue to preach revolution, whereupon the R.M. gave him three months and left the barracks. Blake then saw O'Kelly alone and endeavored to find out who and what he was. It was obvious that the man was not an Irishman, nor did he appear to be English. O'Kelly refused to give him any information regarding himself. While this interview was going on, an auxiliary, whose home was in Scotland and who commanded a section of cadets on temporary duty in Ballybor, looked in to see Blake and found him with O'Kelly. After O'Kelly had left the room, the auxiliary told Blake that he knew the man well and had often seen him in Glasgow, where previous to 1919 the man had lived for two years working as a Jewish Bolshevik agent and that he had suddenly disappeared from Glasgow when the police began to get unpleasantly attentive. End of chapter 18 Chapter 19 of Tales of the Royal Irish Constabulary by Unknown. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 19 Mountain Warfare. The movements of the flying columns of the IRA, gangs of armed ruffians, usually numbering about 40, but sometimes more, sometimes less, and led by men with military experience, ex soldiers, and even ex officers, to their everlasting shame have always corresponded accurately to the amount of police and military pressure brought to bear on them, 
which pressure has continually fluctuated in agreement to the whims and brain waves of the politicians in power. Figuratively speaking, these same politicians have kept the police and military with one hand tied behind their back, and sometimes, when the screams of the mob politicians in the House have been loudest, have very nearly tied up both their hands. If a chart had been kept during the Irish War showing the relative intensity of the politicians' screams and the activities of the IRA, the reading of it would be highly interesting and instructive extra pressure, more rigid enforcement of existing restrictions on movements, and increased military activity have always resulted in a general stampede of flying columns to the mountains of the West, where the gunmen could rest in comparative safety and swagger about among the simple and ignorant mountain folk to their heart's content. Here they would stay until the politicians, frightened by inspired questions in the House, would practically confine the military and police to barracks. The gunmen would then, with great reluctance, leave the safety of the mountains and return to the southern front to carry on once more the good work of political murder. And so the game of seesaw went on. Every time the Crown forces saw victory in sight, the politicians would drag them back again to start all afresh. The wonder is that the Crown forces stuck it so long with every hand against them, and their worst abuse coming from a cowardly section of their own countrymen in England. Early in 1921, the Crown forces in the south of Ireland suddenly gave forth signs that a determined effort was to be made to deal effectively, once and for all, with the gangs of armed murderers and robbers roaming the country, masquerading as soldiers of the Irish Republic, and again the flying columns fled in haste to their mountain retreats in the west, a part of the country where the majority of the inhabitants have always done their best to keep out of the trouble with a few isolated exceptions. This time they stayed longer. In fact, each time it became harder to induce the gunmen to forsake the peace of the mountains for the war in the south. After a time, they started to vary the monotony by carrying out punitive expeditions against the police and the unfortunate loyalists in the surrounding lowlands, but always to fly back to the mountains at the first sight of a force of police or soldiers. Ex-soldiers were the chief game at this period. A district would be chosen where there were no troops and few police. A list of all ex-soldiers living in this district would be made out, and guides provided by the local IRA commandant. Each ex-soldier would be visited in turn during a night, given his choice of active service with the IRA or a sudden death. Those who remained loyal to the king would be led out and butchered like sheep, though possibly the murderers would not take the trouble to remove their victims, but would fire a volley into them as they lay in bed and leave them there. Truly a brave army. Transport presented no difficulty to the gunmen. The British government took practically no steps to control the movements of motors, motor bicycles, or push bicycles, except the motor permit farce, which greatly inconvenienced loyalists only. All they had to do was to commandeer as many cars or bicycles as they wanted, where, when, and how they liked. However, this was not all the work which the Sinn Féin leaders intended their flying columns to carry out, and in order to induce the gunmen to return to duty, the usual noisy peace squeal was started in England, so that conditions might be made pleasanter for the gunmen in the south. The murdering of ex-soldiers and helpless loyalists could be easily carried out by local volunteers under a well-seasoned murderer, an excellent method of initiating raw recruits into the methods of the Sinn Féin idea of warfare. The British government, always great judges of Irish character, thought that the Sinn Féin leaders were coming to their senses at last, took off the pressure, and the gunmen duly returned to duty. At length there came a time when these columns really got the wind up, stampeded to the western mountains, and this time refused point-blank to return to duty. In the late spring of 1921, Blake was suddenly called over to England on private business in London, and afterwards went down to the country to spend a few days with the parents of a man with whom he had served in France. 
The day after his arrival, Blake's host told him that a black and tan, a native of the place, had been murdered in Ireland a few days previously, and was to be buried that day in the parish graveyard, and asked Blake if he would accompany him to the funeral. When passing through Dublin on his way to England, Blake had seen in the castle the account of how this unfortunate black and tan had met his death, shot in the back when walking in the streets of a small western town with a girl. And not content with that, the murderers had fired a volley at him as he lay wounded on the ground, and even fired several shots after the girl as she fled shrieking up the street. So terrified were the townspeople that though there were many in the streets at the time, not one dared to even approach the dying constable, and it was not until a full hour afterwards that a passing police patrol found him lying dead in a great pool of blood. Incidentally, the murderers had by then put sixteen miles between them by means of stolen bicycles. Blake accepted, expecting to see a large funeral to do honor to the murdered policeman, but to his great surprise and indignation, found that only the near relations of the murdered man were present. Returning from the funeral, Blake happened to see the local police inspector in the main street of the little town, and at once tackled him about the funeral, wanting to know why the local police had not been present as a last mark of respect to a man who had died for his country. The inspector seemed greatly surprised and rather taken aback, and replied that he could hardly be expected to turn his men out to attend the funeral of a murderer. For a moment Blake saw red, and, but for a natural horror of making a scene in a public place, would probably have knocked the inspector down. Then, thinking that there must be a bad blunder somewhere, he asked whom the black and tan had murdered, and how he had met his death. The inspector admitted that the black and tan had been murdered, he believed, and then opened out on the crimes and atrocities which the black and tans had committed in Ireland, murder, rape, and highway robbery, in fact the usual list of atrocities which is generally to be read in the Sinn Féin propaganda pamphlets. Blake waited patiently until the inspector had given him a harrowing picture of the condition of the south and west of Ireland heart-rending accounts of homeless and starving women and children, old and young men and boys hunted like wild beasts in the mountains and living on berries and roots, shops burnt to the ground and looted by black and tans in mufti, and of men and boys shot by auxiliaries in the dead of night before the eyes of their relations. He then asked the inspector who had given him this information, adding that he would like to see the proof of it, and at the same time telling him that he was a D.I. in the R.I.C. The inspector invited Blake to go to the police station with him, and here, as Blake had expected, he was shown the usual lying propaganda and pamphlets of Sinn Féin, which have been distributed by the million throughout England, Scotland, Wales, and the U.S.A. An extract from one pamphlet is worth repeating. Quote, Famine is about to add thousands of innocent victims to the hundreds of thousands already in need of the bare necessities that keep body and soul together. In every Irish village and town, sickness, pestilence, and death invade the humble homes, striking swiftly and surely the mothers and children incapable of resistance through months of struggle against cold and hunger children of tender years, ragged and wretched, trudge daily through the cold to a school now used for a relief station to obtain the one meal a day on which they live, a piece of bread and a warm drink." End quote. Seeing from his ribbons that the man had served in the war, Blake asked him if he would take the word of a brother officer against that of a Sinn Féin rebel. The inspector seemed to think this a good joke and replied, a brother officer every time. Well then, said Blake, as an ex-British officer, I give you my word of honor that all those pamphlets you have just shown me are a pack of lies circulated by Irish rebels to ruin your country. Still, the inspector was only half convinced, and in spite of all Blake could say, he saw when he at last left that the man's belief in the printed pamphlets of Sinn Féin was still unshaken. Such is the tremendous effect of print, whether newspapers or pamphlets, on the modern mind, and the firm belief in the old saying that there can be no smoke without a fire. 
That afternoon Blake was carried off by his hostess to a drawing room lecture at a big country house. His hostess was not quite sure what the lecture was about, but believed it had something to do with Russia. After tea, the lecturer arose, and before he uttered a word, Blake had a premonition of what was coming. A tall, thin man with pronounced Celtic peculiarities and a mane of long, lank black hair, Blake had seen his prototype thousands of times in the west of Ireland. Throwing back his great mane with a jerk of his head, the lecturer started on an impassioned recital of the atrocities committed in Ireland by the British Army of Occupation, practically the same collection of lies and wicked quartered truths which Blake had heard from the police inspector that morning. Blake watched the faces of the audience closely, mostly women of the upper and middle classes, and could see that the lecturer's ready tongue was making a deep impression on them. There was no yawning or fidgeting, and the audience, many of them with the parted lips of rapt attention, kept their eyes riveted on the quite interesting face of the wild man of the West, camouflaged by a London tailor to harmonize with an English drawing-room. Blake let the man have a fair innings, and then, while he was drinking a glass of water, Blake felt like asking him if he would not prefer poteen, stood up and said quietly, Ladies and gentlemen, so far this lecture has been nothing but a pack of lies from beginning to end. The lecturer is a Sinn Féin rebel camouflaged as an Irish gentleman, and I am a D.I. of the Royal Irish Constabulary. During the war I fought for your country, and the lecturer probably assisted the Boches in every underhand and mean way he could. You can judge for yourselves which of us is most probably telling the truth and nothing but the truth. The wild man turned with a wicked snarl, all signs of the veneer gone, and his face reminded Blake of a cornered gunman he had had to deal with once during a raid on a Dublin lodging house. And there would probably have been an ugly and unseemly scene, but the owner of the house intervened and gently but firmly led the wild man out of the room, while Blake and his friends left the house at once. On his return, Blake found a cipher wire from his county inspector, recalling him at once, and going by car to London, managed to catch the Irish mail from Euston. All the sleepers were engaged, but by good luck he found himself in possession of a first-class compartment. While idly smoking a cigarette and meditating on the extraordinary amount of Sinn Féin propaganda he had met with in the course of one short day in England, he noticed a well-dressed, slight girl pass and repass the glass door of his compartment several times. As the mail pulled out of the station, this girl pulled open the sliding door from the corridor and sat down opposite Blake, remarking that it was a grand evening and thereby unconsciously informing him that she was Irish. Suddenly realizing that he was smoking, he asked the girl, who he could see was unusually pretty and quite young, if she had any objection, and as he had expected, she readily entered into conversation. After a time she remarked with a pretty engaging smile that she saw he had nothing to read, and getting down her suitcase handed Blake a handful of the identical pamphlets he had already seen that morning in the English country police station. In addition, there was one fresh one on the Irish issue by William J. M. A. Maloney, M.D., Captain in the British Army, August 1914, August 1916. Blake then saw that his original suspicion was correct, and that he had to deal with that most dangerous of all spies, Sinn Féin or any other breed, a pretty girl. By the time rugby was passed, he had heard the simple life story in a rural part of England of the girl, ending with the information that she was going to Dublin for three months, and that she was very much in dread after all the dreadful happenings there she had read of in the newspapers and she had never been in ireland before all this in a very fine rich dublin brogue and blake began to think that he must really possess that most priceless of assets to look a much bigger fool than you are after the stop at Crewe, the girl again attacked him about Dublin, asking if he lived in lodgings there, and if so, was there a room to let in the same house? 
A few days previously, Michael Collins's flat in a certain Dublin street had been raided with satisfactory results to the raiders, and Blake gave her this address, assuring her that she would here find quarters entirely suitable to her requirements. The girl took the hint, and the rest of the journey to Holyhead was spent in silence. On the mail boat, Blake saw the girl once more sitting with a youthful officer of the Dublin garrison and carrying on an animated conversation with their heads touching. On arriving at Ballybor Barracks, Blake found further orders awaiting him from the county inspector to proceed at once to Castleport with all the men and cars he could spare. The wildest rumors were afloat amongst his men that the IRA were going to take the field openly, this notable achievement was reserved for the truce. That a large force of Americans had landed from a yacht at Erinane with stacks of arms, and that they were raising and arming the mountain men of that district greatly against their wish and inclination, and that de Valera had been landed on the west coast from a submarine, was hiding in the mountains of Ballyrick, and was at long last going to take the field himself. Collecting every man he could spare, and taking all the transport except one Crosley, Blake set off with a strong convoy of police for Castleport. The men were in great heart and eagerly looking forward to a good square fight in the open with the hitherto elusive soldiers of the IRA. At Castleport they found the barracks packed with police, drawn in from all the outlying districts. Even two large houses adjacent to the barracks had had to be commandeered to hold all the men. The county inspector explained the situation, which was quite simple. A large force of IRA flying columns, estimated at over a thousand strong, were reported to have refused to return to the south and had taken up permanent quarters in the Maryburg Peninsula, northwest of Veranane, and were playing old puck generally throughout that part of the west. At first these flying columns had been distributed all through the mountains, some in the Ballyrick country, more in the Slevino mountains, and a large party to the south of Castleport, but owing to the unpleasant attentions of auxiliary flying columns, they had gradually retired towards the Maryburg Peninsula, where so far they had been left unmolested. The gunmen at the Slivenamo Mountains had had a bad fright from the very efficient company of auxiliaries quartered at Annex. Father John had done all in his power to get rid of these unwelcome guests in his parish, but showing a fine turn of speed, they just managed to escape, actually dashing through Ballybor in the middle of the night in a convoy of commandeered fords a few days before Blake's return. For some time the gunmen had been in the habit of commandeering their rations at night from Castleport, and during these nights the town would be completely isolated. The first intimation of anything being wrong which the townspeople had was the return one night of several white-faced crying girls who told their parents that they had just by chance met Pat so-and-so and that he had asked them to go for a stroll, and hardly had they got outside the town when armed men had seized poor Patine and ordered the girls to go home at once. Incidentally, the poor patines were kept as a labor platoon by the gunmen and made to do all the dirty work of digging trenches, breaking down bridges, and so forth, which occurred during the operations to follow. A different butcher, baker, and grocer would be visited each time just to show that there was no question of favoritism with the IRA. While this requisitioning was proceeding, every road leading into Castleport was held by strong pickets of gunmen who, as soon as the ration party returned, would make for the Maryburg Mountains on bicycles, the ration party traveling on a commandeered lorry. Directly the county inspector got wind of this proceeding, he made an attempt to surprise the gunmen one night, but their local information was too good, and he failed. Then, hearing that this big muster of gunmen was hiding in the Maryburg Peninsula, he collected all the forces he could and prepared to kill, capture, or drive them into the Atlantic. Soon after Blake's arrival at Castleport, apparently reliable information came in that a landing of arms had been carried out early that morning at Erinane, and that these arms were to be taken as soon as it was dark to the Maryburg Peninsula. The county inspector at once detailed Blake and Black, the Castleport D.I., 
to take a large force of police and attempt to seize the arms before they could be taken out of Errinane. Errinane lies about 21 miles to the south of Castleport on a narrow inland bay. The road runs the whole way through wild mountainous country, though at no point does the road run very close to the mountains. On the way out, Blake carefully looked out for any points where an ambush might be carried out, and noticed that there were two bad spots, one where the road skirted the edge of a wood with a rocky hill close on the other side, the second about eight miles from Castleport, where the road twisted through a ravine with steep rocky sides dotted with bushes, and at one place crossed a narrow high bridge, an ideal place for an ambush. Blake was so much impressed with this place that he stopped the cars and made his men search carefully the sides of the ravine, but not a sign of any preparations for an ambush could they find, nor were there any trenches on the road. After picketing Aranane, Blake searched every house, shop, store, and barn in the village, but not a sign of arms could be found, nor was any yacht to be seen in the harbor. It was late when they started back for Castleport, and Blake, who was suspicious of an ambush at the bridge in the ravine, which was the nearest point on the road to the Maryburg country, ordered Black to go ahead with two Crosleys and to search the ravine thoroughly, and then to wait until the rest of the force caught him up. Blake's party was delayed by two punctures, and when they got near to the ravine, heavy firing suddenly broke out ahead of them. When, within half a mile of the bridge, they saw a party of men running away from a culvert in a dip of the road ahead of them. Luckily, Blake was in the leading car and ordered the driver to pull up about a hundred yards short of the culvert, which, sure enough, went up before they had been waiting two minutes. The firing ahead had now grown heavier, and every now and then the dull thud of a bursting mills bomb could be heard above the racket of musketry. Realizing that Black must be hard-pressed, Blake divided his force into two, ordered each party to deploy on one side of the road, and attempt to outflank the ravines. When within three hundred yards of the bridge, both parties came under heavy enfilade machine-gun fire, machine-guns which made a noise none had ever heard before, and were probably American Thompson guns, and they were forced to take the best cover they could find in the open bog. The machine-gun fire at once died down, only to break out again every time the police attempted to advance by short rushes. By painful degrees they managed to get within eighty yards of the bridge, where the formation of the ground protected them from that horrible enfilade hail of bullets, and gathering themselves together they charged at the reverse slope of the ravine. At once the firing ceased, and when at last they had torn their way through briars and gorse to reach the top, all that they found was small piles of empty cartridges and two ordinary tweed caps, not a sign of a gunman whichever way they looked. They then turned their attention to their comrades on the road, and here a heartening sight met their eyes. At first it appeared as though all the occupants of the two cars were either dead or wounded, but as they descended towards the bridge, a small party of police crawled from beneath it, soaked to the skin. They found Black lying against the front wheel of the leading car with four bullet wounds in his body and his head smashed in by a dum-dum bullet, stone dead. Blake found out from the survivors that Black had disregarded his orders and had not pulled up until the cars had passed the bridge, when a hail of bullets swept the cars from the top of both banks of the ravine. Black was wounded by the first volley, was hit twice while getting out of the car to lead his men to the attack, and in the head as his foot touched the ground. The sun had by now gone down, and collecting all his wounded and dead, Blake pushed off for Castleport as fast as he could. Beyond a blown-up culvert half a mile from the ravine, which the cars crossed without difficulty on their own planks, they met with no further trouble. Then followed three feverish days of planning and preparing for the great drive, which it was hoped would put a thousand gunmen out of action for good and all. Unless, indeed, a new chief secretary should come to Ireland, perhaps this time from Australia, or possibly from India, or even a Jew, who would celebrate his arrival in this unfortunate country by opening wide the gates of the internment camps. 
The area to be driven was roughly 360 square miles, which will give some idea of the magnitude of the task which a handful of police had to tackle with the aid of a battalion of infantry and a company of auxiliaries. And when it is added that the entire peninsula consisted of mountains, five of them well over 2,000 feet and unclimbable in many places, bogs, lakes, and rivers, with only one decent road which ran round the coast and at the base, it will be granted that the task was nearly an impossible one. Also, the few scattered inhabitants would be certain to be found to act as unwilling scouts for the gunmen. Moreover, once the weather turned wet, which may happen in the course of a few hours on the west coast, a thick mist would cover the mountains, and all the gunmen had to do then was to walk out of the trap and make their way inland. The plan of attack was as follows. The Castleport Aranane Road crossed the twenty-mile neck of the peninsula, and before dawn one day ten columns each of eighty men formed up a mile apart. As soon as it was light enough to see, these columns started, marching in columns of route for the first two miles. They then deployed into open order, got in touch with each other, and then started to drive the country out of face for the remaining eighteen miles. Frequently the line had to halt while a column would hunt a mountain in its line of advance, or a detour round a lake had to be made. For the first four miles there was no sign of the gunman. The column only met flocks of mountain sheep and no sign of a human being. But then, ten miles from the west end of the peninsula, the troops on both flanks came under fire, evidently an attempt to stop them working round behind the gunman. The troops in the center now tried to advance, but were also held up by heavy fire before they had gone half a mile. But at their third attempt, the flanks met with no opposition, and the whole line was able to continue the advance. From now on, the gunmen offered a determined resistance at every ridge, but always retired before their positions could be turned. At last, close on nightfall, the crown forces came to the strongest position of all, a long ridge in the center with small hills at each end, extending to the north and south coasts of the peninsula. As there was no time for a turning movement, a direct assault was tried, only to fail twice. It was then decided to wait until the full moon had risen, when it would be possible to make a turning movement along the coast. Unfortunately, the sky became cloudy, and during the whole night the crown forces were unable to move. But as soon as the daylight came, another assault met with no opposition. Once on top of the ridge, they could see the remainder of the peninsula to the west coast, and not a sign of a gunman anywhere. Nor, when they searched every valley and even some sand hills on the coast, could they find so much as a single gunman. The following day, word was brought into the barracks at Castleport that a column of gunmen, thousands strong, had been seen marching in column of route into the Ballyrick Mountains from the coast, but how they could have got there from the Maryburg Peninsula did not transpire for some time. Later it was learnt that when the Crown forces gave up the attack on the final ridge to wait for the moon, the gunmen waited until it was dark when they made their way to the coast. Here they had collected every fishing boat to be found. The sea being calm, the whole force managed during the night to cross the bay to the north, a distance of fifteen miles, landed on the Ballyrick coast soon after dawn, and at once set off for the Ballyrick Mountains. End of chapter 19「Chapter Twenty of Tales of the Royal Irish Constabulary by Unknown. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty: The Great Roundup. At the beginning of the Irish War, when the IRA, to use its own words, took the field against the British Army, its activities were purely local and sporadic. Some unfortunate police patrols of half a dozen men, often less, walking along the King's Highway, interfering with none except evildoers, would be suddenly fired at with shotguns, sometimes loaded with jagged slugs and pieces of metal, from a safe cover behind a stone wall with carefully prepared loopholes. 
These police patrols never had a dog's chance and should have been discontinued long before they actually were. At first the murderers did not trouble to make sure that they had a perfectly safe line of retreat behind them when the location of these cowardly ambushes was chosen, but after a few failures they made no mistake in future. The line of retreat, either through a thick wood or down the reverse slope of a hill, being always the first consideration. Married police living in houses or rooms in the town of their station afforded an easy and safe target for the venom of these hooligan shop boys and farmer sons. At first the police used to go home unarmed and used to be shot down in the back while passing along an ill-lighted street or lane or the assassins would knock at the door of the policeman's home, and if he came to the door, would fire at him and then run away. Occasionally, in districts where the standard of bravery was very high, all the volunteers would collect in a small town after dark, always after dark, and carry out an attack on the local police barracks. They knew perfectly well that it was impossible for the police to leave their barracks owing to the smallness of their numbers, and that as long as they kept well under cover, which they did, they were just as safe as they would be in their own beds at home. These so-called attacks on police barracks simply consisted in gangs of hooligans first taking careful cover in houses adjacent to the barracks, and then firing off as many rounds as they possessed. They always ceased fire long before daybreak in order that they might be home in good time before it was possible for the police to leave barracks or a relief party to arrive on the scene. At this period of the war, raiding the houses of the loyalists for arms and incidentally for money and valuables, not forgetting drink, was a much safer and more remunerative night's amusement than shooting policemen or attacking barracks, though the price then was sixty pounds for every policeman murdered. A party of twenty to thirty volunteers, usually boys from fifteen to twenty years of age, would meet at a fixed rendezvous some time after dark with all the arms they could raise. They would then don black cloth masks, turn up their coat collars, pull their hats down, and sally forth to spend the night robbing, murdering, and terrorizing the unfortunate loyalists of the district. Imagine the feelings of a respectable old man in living in a lonely house who had probably never harmed anyone during his lifetime, and whose only crime consisted in being loyal, or refusing to subscribe to the funds of the IRA, in many cases a form of common robbery. Night after night he lies in bed, expecting to hear a loud knock at the door, and at last it comes. He opens the door to find a dozen shotguns, old rifles, and pistols pointed at him. Some brute then demands his arms. The old man says he has none. They push him aside and force their way in. The old man is made to sit down while two young hounds keep prodding him in the back of the neck with the muzzles of their pistols to remind him what they could do if they liked. The remainder ransack the house from top to bottom, take away any money or valuables they can find, and consume any drink there may be. If they cannot find any money or valuables, they threaten him with death until he disgorges, and lonely women suffered in like fashion. The demands for arms used to be merely a blind for committing robbery. The location of every firearm in a district was well known from the beginning of the war. If the reader happens to be an English country gentleman, let him think what it would be like never to know the night or hour when he would be raided by a gang of farm laborers or village loafers, armed and masked, from the nearest village. He might retire to bed, to be waked up by loud knocking on his front door. If he did not open quickly, a rifle shot would be fired through the lock, and if the door did not open then, it quickly would, to the blows of hatchets which would follow. A wild gang of drunken brutes would burst into his nice house, smash desks, sideboards, and cupboards, searching for loot. Lucky man if he escaped with the loss of arms, money, and valuables, and not of home and life as well. If the reader is an ex-soldier, let him imagine what his feelings would be like if, in the middle of the night, he was pulled out of his bed by these same ruffians and given his choice between joining Trotsky's own light infantry, or whatever the local red force may call itself, or being shot out of face. 
Being true to his country, he refuses to have anything to do with Bolshevism and is shot before the eyes of his agonized wife. Remember that the loyal country gentlemen and ex-soldiers of Ireland have sacrificed their blood and treasure on the altar of empire, as well as their English cousins, and hence are entitled to as much protection. But no, when it comes to a matter of politics and votes, they are thrown to the wolves, to the eternal shame of England. The sacrifice of the southern loyalist will form one of the most disgraceful chapters in the history of England. Robberies on a more extensive scale followed, bank managers taking large sums of money to out-of-the-way villages on the occasion of a fair, in order to facilitate payments by buyers to farmers, were held up and robbed. Mail cars carrying pension money for the old and poor were held up and robbed. Likewise, post offices, banks, railway stations, and large shops, and most of this money used to forward the cause of armed rebellion. In fact, the government were largely being fought with their own money, or rather that of the helpless British taxpayer. But this form of warfare, though most unpleasant for the unfortunate Irish loyalist, and probably disturbing to the few people in England who knew anything about what was happening in Ireland, would never have led to anything, provided the British government had taken the necessary steps quickly to preserve law and order and punish evildoers. But no, as ever in Ireland, they would do nothing except procrastinate until it was too late. Instead of strengthening the IRC and sending more troops into the country, they merely evacuated outlying police barracks, which were promptly burnt amidst scenes of triumph by the local volunteers, and hailed by all rebels as the first outward sign of the retreat of the English from Ireland. If the police released by the evacuation of these barracks had been used to form flying columns to quiet the worst districts, there might have been some sense in this maneuver. Unfortunately, the men were all wanted to make up the wastage in the occupied barracks caused by the large number of resignations of young constables in the IRC at this time. Looking back, these constables who resigned appear to have been mean deserters of their comrades, but after events have to a certain degree justified their action. They were certain that no matter how often the British government swore to see its loyal servants through, in the end it would let them down, and the pity is that they were right. True, there was a day when an Englishman's word was as good as his bond, but that day appears to be quite out of date or perhaps it does not apply to politicians. Doubtless, greatly surprised at their initial success, the chiefs of the IRA now determined on a more ambitious form of warfare, namely the formation of flying columns to harry and murder the Crown forces throughout Ireland, not excepting Ulster. At the same time, they started a tremendous campaign of propaganda in England and the States. The idea of breaking up the British Empire by means of a number of small flying columns of corner boys in Ireland and green pamphlets at John Bull's breakfast table appears laughable, but Sinn Féin has shown itself a wonderfully astute judge of the mentality of the present-day politician in England. The summer of 1920 saw the greater part of the South and West in the hands of the Republic, who not only boasted an army in the field, but ran their own police, law courts, and local government board. It was not an uncommon occurrence for a man to be first arrested by the RIC for some offense, and then by the IRA. Sometimes there used to be quite an exciting race between these two forces to see who could reach the culprit first. The first flying columns were made up of determined and hard-up corner boys collected from every district in the South and West, and were sent out under specially qualified leaders to murder as many police and soldiers as they could, no matter whether they were armed or unarmed, asleep or awake. The price for the murder of a policeman rose gradually to sixty pounds, and eventually to a hundred pounds. With a terrorized population and a government which refused to function, these columns had everything in their favor and carried on their campaign of murder and assassination practically unhindered at first. Their chief channels of information were the post office and young girls. The larger proportion of post office officials were openly disloyal, postmasters even being caught red-handed decoding important police and military wires for the information of the IRA.
and young girls not only obtained information by walking out with policemen and soldiers, but also carried the gunman's arms to and from a murder or ambush. It used to be no uncommon sight in Dublin to see a tram car held up by auxiliaries and searched with no result. Before the auxiliaries had boarded the tram, the gunmen would openly pass their pistols to girls sitting beside them. Anyone giving information would never have left that tram alive, nor would it have done any good, as the auxiliaries were powerless, until near the end of the war, to search women. As regards transport, they had only to take it where, when, and how they liked motors motorcycles lorries and push bicycles by the thousand in every part of the country think how different the result might have been if the government had taken up all this transport and reduced the ira to their flat feet and of course they used the trains freely and without payment both to carry arms and men young girls especially if pretty make far the most dangerous spies in the world and though they have always been used during a war on a small scale by every country yet this is probably the first occasion on which a nation has conscripted girls of from twelve to twenty-five years wholesale for this vicious and contaminating work even little children were taught the art of eavesdropping and of course if they did not hear every word readily filled in the blanks from their imagination many a man in ireland during the last two years has lost his life through the medium of a little child the mark of this woman ought to appear on the day of judgment with the record millstone around her neck dispatches were carried in dozens of ways boys on bicycles men on motor bicycles who also acted as scouts for ambushes in the sample cases of bagmen a common method also at one time of sending arms and ammunition about the country by the post and by railway guards in fact every method which came to hand the ira obtained much valuable information through opening letters in the post but their really important and often vital information came to them through a bad leakage in the castle any shortage of recruits was quickly made good by a drastic form of the old press gang an unwilling recruit would be dragged out of bed in the middle of the night placed against a wall and given a minute to decide for king george or the irish republic king george meant a bullet in the brain probably a dum-dum of the worst description the irish republic meant active service with a flying column at some near future date money was obtained in just as simple a way a levy of say a pound a cow or a pound a beast would be laid on a district a farmer had six cows or one horse two asses and three head of cattle in either case he would pay six pounds to the funds of the ira any arguing there was would be solely on the side of the collector who would have the butt end of a large pistol protruding from his pocket such a simple and effective method of collecting a tax no troublesome forms of beastly red tape and no large staff of fat and lazy clerks to pay just a truculent-looking blackguard with a very large pistol not necessarily loaded and the money pours in cases of non-payment of this form of taxation have never been heard of nor is there any means of dodging it cattle are not easy to hide rations were obtained by the simple process of requisition in some cases they used to go through the farce of giving a receipt for the stolen goods in the name of the ira with the police unable to function banks and post offices offered an easy prey to these ruffians the meanest form of robbery was the taking of money to pay old age pensions from mail cars on their way to outlying districts a special murder gang was formed which went about the country to murder any man policeman r m or civilian who was particularly active in trying or helping to restore law and order in the country that is any man who was too tough a nut for the locals to crack and of course in many cases private feuds and spites came under this heading as has been mentioned the price for a policeman was a hundred pounds people would be heard discussing this openly and wondering if the price would go up or down in the same way as they might discuss dunlop's or guinness's shares 
but the most effective weapon of Sinn Fein has been their propaganda campaign in America and England, coupled with the treasonable and treacherous aid from certain politicians and the effective silence of the daily press, with one great and notable exception. The following letter, which fell into the hands of the Crown forces in Ireland, speaks for itself. Dial Arenane, Department of Finance, Mansion House, Dublin, 21st March, 1921. To Director of Propaganda. Ashara, the enclosed copy of notes from Ireland will probably be of some interest to you. I have previously sent some copies of these and other things from the Unionist Alliance people. Many figures have been given in the papers recently with regard to RIC resignations, dismissals, recruitment. All these questions have been asked on instructions from me, and I think you might be able to make very good use of some of them. For instance, in the 10th March Hansard, pages 688 and 689, are given the figures which appeared in the Independent some days ago. In a few days' time we shall get total strength and total numbers recruited over certain periods. I have got an arrangement made in London whereby the independent correspondents will always quote the figures pretty fully for our benefit. Doshara, Michael Collins. Sinn Féin first learnt the art of propaganda from those past masters, the Boches, but if ever the latter think of trying their luck with another Der Tog, they will find that Sinn Féin can teach them now more than ever they taught Sinn Féin. The Celtic mind seems to be peculiarly adapted and susceptible to propaganda, consisting largely of half and three-quarter lies. But nothing surprised and dismayed Irish loyalists more than the suppression of reports of murders and outrages in Ireland in the great majority of English papers, though later on these same papers filled columns with any murder or atrocity alleged to have been committed by police or auxiliaries. Moreover, from their tone, it soon became obvious that some papers were strongly pro Sinn Féin. To an Irishman, the English radical has always been one of the greatest wonders and mysteries of this world, and often he cannot help asking why God has sent him into the world. Of course, there is no doubt that all are here for some purpose, good or bad, but of what use is the radical to England? Is he the wee drop of poison in the hole which is to bring about the downfall of the empire as a punishment for the sins of its leaders? At any rate, he has always been a puzzle and enigma to Irish and French alike, and they have no use for a man whose chief idea of patriotism appears to be to take any and every side against his own country. There is no possible doubt that the government were forced or frightened by the howls of the radicals incited by Sinn Féin propaganda to order that reprisals by the Crown forces in Ireland should cease whereby the Crown Force's most effective weapon was taken from them, though it was still left in the hands of the murder gang. Fierce were the denouncements by the radicals in the house of the unfortunate Irish police, but one waited in vain for a like denouncement of the murder gang, men who have committed as bad atrocities as the world has seen, by these same unctuous gentlemen, ye hypocrites much has been said and written chiefly propaganda about the wickedness of reprisals but it is better first to examine the situation before condemning them it must be clearly understood that the whole power of the murder gang lay in reprisals they took reprisals against every one who was against them by murder arson and intimidation the crown forces had only the law which was paralyzed no one dared give evidence it was death to do so under these circumstances the crown forces principally the r i c took counter reprisals this was the only possible method by which they could save their own lives and the lives and property of the loyalists who looked to them for protection for many weary months unhappy ireland was rent and torn by this form of warfare and it became obvious to most that if one side did not win pretty soon the country would be ruined twice the crown forces wriggled their hands free and on both occasions had the ira on the verge of collapse one stout blow would have finished the show and each time the ira were saved by the screams of their english allies each time the government quickly took fright 
quickly tied the crown force's right hands and even threatened to tie up their legs if they set the english radicals on the howl again and once more the ira plucked up courage and the old weary game of ambush and murder started afresh at long last the government took a sudden notion to make a desperate effort to finish off the gunmen before the gunmen finished them after the failure to round up the big force of gunmen in the maryburg peninsula blake returned at once to ballybor with all his men arriving to find a cipher wire from the county inspector to tell him that the gunmen had turned up in the ballyrick mountains than that as soon as the crown forces could be regrouped another effort would be made to come to grips with these slippery customers no sooner had blake started to deal with a fearful accumulation of official correspondence than the head constable told him that constable john McHugh, who came from the east centre of ireland and had not been long in the force wished to see him adding that McHugh's father had been murdered and that the constable was most anxious to go home but that the police at his home had wired that it was not safe for the man to go blake saw McHugh at once and found him in a pitiable state of grief the first great sorrow of his young life but had to refuse his request though the boy pleaded hard with the tears running down his cheeks McHugh's case is a good example of the murder gang's reprisals on those who will not fall in with their views old McHugh was a widower living with his two sons near a large town on the east coast unfortunately john was an unwilling witness of the first murders of british officers in ireland during the present rebellion and in order to save the lives of his sons old McHugh got them into the r i c as soon as he could on several occasions old McHugh was threatened by the i r a that if he did not make his sons resign they would do for him every time he refused and told his sons nothing about being threatened finally the usual pack of masked fiends went to the old man's cottage in the dead of night and murdered him by the refined process of dragging him out of bed and kicking him on the head until they smashed his skull in a deed hard to beat for pure brutal savagery the following day blake received a long visit from the county inspector who gave him the outline of the new plan of campaign and instructions for the part blake and his men were to take the country of the ballyrick mountains is a square-shaped peninsula of roughly fourteen hundred square miles consisting of vast flats of bogs on the north west and east intercepted by hills while the south part consists of nothing but mountains one main road runs through the centre east and west and another skirts the coast for three-quarters of the north coast then turns inland crosses the other road at about the centre of the peninsula at the village of ballyscadden then continues due south until it reaches the coast in the whole peninsula there are only half a dozen small villages all not less than sixteen miles apart to drive this huge country would require at least twenty times as many troops as were available and the a s c train to keep them supplied with rations there remained the possibility of starving the gunmen into surrender all the villages were to be occupied by military and every road picketed and blocked with barbed wire at the same time the military were to endeavor to form a cordon across the neck of the peninsula a distance of thirty-five miles the police who were to do the actual hunting were divided into flying columns with all available transport the navy was to be responsible for the numerous islands on the west and south coasts and were to open fire on any parties of gunmen who came within the range of their vision and guns aeroplanes were to work continuously over the country during daylight and on locating the enemy were to drop their messages at the police headquarters at ballyscadden it was expected that at the first sign of danger the gunmen would make for the mountains in the south when the area of operations would be greatly restricted when all preparations were completed a start was to be made as soon as there seemed a reasonable prospect of fine weather finally at blake's suggestion they tried to collect every flock of mountain sheep and confine them to the flat country to the north but after the first day many of the sheep returned to their own mountains in spite of the efforts of the shepherds blake's part was to keep all his available men at headquarters ready to dash off at a moment's notice on receipt of information of the location of any party of gunmen 
Owing to a bad westerly storm, operations had to be postponed for a few days, during which time the gunmen were left undisturbed. As had been expected, they drew a blank in the flat country, though it was reported by the first plane up that a large party of cyclists had been spotted making their way south from Balascaden some time before the police occupied that village. The weather then turned very fine, and as there was a full moon, it was decided to sit tight for a few days in order to see whether starvation would force the gunmen to attempt a breakthrough. For two days the aeroplanes had nothing to report except the movements of small parties of not more than six men, and always in the mountains to the south. On the third, a plane dropped the exciting news that a big column, estimated at several hundred men, was marching southwest with an advance of scouts to a depth of two miles. Blake at once turned out his men and made off south at full speed. At the same time, a column left Castleport to make its way up the coast road and intercept the gunmen before they could debouche from the mountains their orders being to advance up a valley from the coast to a shooting lodge which was situated at the junction of three valleys, two of which led northeast and southwest round the foot of Falcon Mountain. Here they were to wait while Blake endeavored to drive the gunmen down the northeast valley towards them. For twenty-four hours Blake kept up a running fight with the gunmen in the mountains, always trying to head them towards the valley which leads to the foot of Falcon Mountain and at last, when his men could hardly move, had the satisfaction of seeing the gunmen making for the valley. The police followed slowly and painfully to find not a sign of a human being at the shooting lodge. The men flung themselves down in the heather, beat to the world, and some of them even burst into tears of rage. The explanation came afterwards. The Castleport party received orders to proceed up the valley from the sea and intercept the gunmen at a shooting lodge. Unfortunately, there were two lodges, one on the shore of a lake about halfway up the valley from the sea, and the second and right one at the junction of the three valleys. Naturally, the Castleport party, none of whom had been in these mountains before, stopped at the first lodge they came to on the shore of the lake. A thick mist came up off the sea that night, and the gunmen, who had taken refuge on the upper rocky slopes of Falcon Mountain, slipped through the cordon in the mist in twos and threes, commandeered bicycles, and so made good their escape. Some time afterwards, being again very hard-pressed, large parties of gunmen took up their quarters in the Ballyrick Mountains and lay low. Gradually their numbers increased, until it was reported that the mountains carried as many gunmen as sheep. At this time the government appeared to have at last realized that the only way to restore order in Ireland was to oppose force by superior force. Many people could have given them this information months previously. A report went through Ireland that the government was amassing artillery at Holyhead to mow down the IRA with their brutal high explosives and shrapnel. In reality, what happened was that all batteries in England were turned into mounted infantry, only about 25 men being left with a battery, and concentrated at Holyhead preparatory to crossing to Ireland. To Blake's joy, the Ballyrick country was chosen as the first scene of what was fondly supposed would be the end of the rebellion. Quickly, 20,000 troops were massed across the neck of the Ballyrick Peninsula with every available auxiliary and a large force of RIC, while a naval force was standing by off the coast, ready to land sailors and marines. All that was wanted was a good weather forecast to start in and put an end to this great mob of gunmen, the curse of modern Ireland. The good weather forecast came along all right, and on the morrow they were to get a move on and put an end to this miserable breed of cowardly warfare. But on the morrow, instead of the advance, they heard the stand fast sounded, and to their dismay learnt that a truce had been proclaimed, a truce with murderers forsooth. End of chapter 20